Hi, this week we are looking at Egyptian love poetry, and probably love poetry is not something that we associate with Egypt, uh, but it is an interesting perspective uh, to look at when we are looking at this ancient civilization. So before we even look at the love poetry itself, let's talk a little bit about Egypt. And I mean very little because it is, needless to say, very difficult to cover 5,000 years in one module, let alone if we had an entire semester to devote to it. So when we look at Egypt, we're looking at the prehistory up to approximately 3100 BCE, before the Common Era which would be still in the Neolithic period. Um, that means that it was still like the, um, the Stone Age, right? Uh, the Neolithic period in general ends when humans are forming civilizations and domestication of animals, but they still before then were using tools and things like that. So we are not looking at that period at all. When we get to about 3100 BCE to 1050 BCE. In general, we are looking at what is called the Ancient Egypt period. And uh, around 1050, this is when Egypt starts to decline as this whole state um, and a series of conquerors do invade. But it still is a, a, a complete in total Egypt, which is being run by pharaohs. It is until 32 BCE, where it becomes a province of Rome, and the last pharaoh is Cleopatra. So um, the much disastrous love affair between Mark Anthony and Cleopatra uh, leads to the ending of total Egyptian rule. Then that lasts, the Roman province of Egypt lasts all the way up until we get into the Common Era. Uh, the year 642, this is when Arab Muslims um, conquered, and that lasted all the way up into the modern age and the Ottoman Empire. So we're not even going to be looking anywhere near that. Um, what do we get from, from Egypt? Some common technology that we get from them. We get the 365 solar calendar. So that is how we are placing our calendar to the movement of the sun and not to the movement of the moon. So that divides kind of neatly. And then as we know, because every four years it becomes a leap year, it doesn't divide totally. So we have to add a day every four years. They also were very sophisticated in other technology areas like geometry, astronomy, they knew very well. And of course we have papyrus, which is a very easy and more sophisticated way of writing things down than clay tablets, because you can't really carry a lot of clay tablets around, right? As we know, because um, we associate a lot of times Egypt with the mummies, um, it seems that they had um, this, the difference between life and death was not metaphoric. You were alive in this world, and when you were, your body was dead, you were alive in another world. It was just a continuation of your life, I guess we can call it. And we see that evidence with the mummification of bodies, the careful burials, the canoptic jars where the organs are taken out of the body, but they're still hanging around the body. You know, you're going to need them in the afterlife. So it was very, it's a very interesting type of death culture or aspect of death culture. And you can look at our map here. We can see the Nile River and a lot of the different cities. 
and of course uh, civilizations are always cropping up against uh, by rivers because of irrigation, trade, things like that. So that's where we see a lot of cities, and it holds true to today. We have uh, New York City, we have the Hudson Bay, you know, we go, go to Paris, it's around a river, go to London, it's around a river, etc. Let's look a little bit more at Egypt, a little bit more of a background. The Egyptian language is related to Semitic languages, which also includes Arabic and Hebrew. And that makes sense if you look at our uh, chart over here, this is a modern chart, where you can see where Egypt is and how close it is related to the other societies. So modern day Israel is right here, but of course we have um, the Arab societies and going all the way over here in this in this area, uh, we go all the way back to you know, Hammurabi and Gilgamesh. So, no wonder why the languages are connected or related. If we look here, you know, we're looking at Egyptian love poetry because there really is no central text to focus on. There are certain texts that are definitive of uh, a society. So we know the Odyssey or the Iliad, things like that. They really stick out. Um, even, even you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, 5,000 years gives us a lot of time and a lot of readings, but there's no definitive Egyptian text per se. So it gives us a lot of leeway to think of things that we could study uh, about Egypt. So love poetry might be an interesting part. You'll make up your mind about that. The Egyptians overall, again, I'm talking about 5,000 years, um, were highly literate. The culture prized learning. And as one warning was found from a, a father to his son, if you do not get an education, you will wind up a washerman. So I think that's pretty similar to parents today. If you don't go and get your education, where are you going to work? Make it ease. Target, maybe. You know, so it's always that admonishment. This one is an interesting one. There's definitely three distinct creation stories. Four, maybe, even. You know, when you're talking about the ancient world, it's really hard to be definitive about things because, again, we're looking at a span of 5,000 years, and we can see distinct stories that um, have been told, but then also is some kind of blurring, as you can only imagine when you have 5,000 years of history to look at. I mean, you can't, you can't get a, a straight story from the last 10, 10 years of our modern life, right? If you want to pick out a story about something. So I do have a video that talks a little bit about the creation stories from, from Egypt. So you can look at that if you want to. It's interesting. It's interesting to see how cultures define their origins. Um, and there's so many worldwide. There's just a, a huge plethora of them. It uh, can be quite entertaining if you're only familiar with, you know, your own to see what, what humans have come up with. So I think it's an interesting thing to look at. Now, let's just take a look at the love poetry itself, or at least a background about the love poetry itself. Let me make sure that this is viewable. It's a little bit off the screen. Um, I, I'm totally mad about memes, so I always like to pop them in wherever I can get them. Hmm. So anyway, love poetry, from the most part, is coming from Egypt's New Kingdom period, which is approximately 1539 to 1075 before the Common Era, which is then where Egypt starts to its decline, right, around that period. And we see or found, again, I'm putting myself in there, we, I had nothing to do with it. It was found that um, most of it in a town 
that was used or lived in by people who were building the tombs, the tombs of Ramses and of King Tut in particular. So that just tells us that the people in that area were literate and they had time to construct poetry. Probably a lot of the poetry itself was first told orally and then written down, like we see a lot in the ancient world. And there is some evidence that beloved poetry was used in schools. So students were actually not composing the love poetry, but they were copying the love poetry and learning in, in that manner. So there's a history behind it. When we actually look at the poetry itself, or the few selections that, that we have, we can see that the poems are from the perspective of those that are without power. They're the lovelorn, and they're going towards uh, a person who has the power. So it's not coming from the person who has, you know, all the money and riches, etc., and pining away for their washerman. It's the opposite, which, of course, we see a desire for social superiority, and this does not go away. Just check out Instagram any day. They also deify the loved one. The beloved is, is div divine. And again, I think this is, very, this is a concept that we understand. It's kind of modern. You know, you, you, when you have a crush on somebody, they can become very bigger um, than, uh, than a human. I'm not really saying that you're thinking them in a, in a godlike fashion, but it's like, they become to, they start to occupy your mind more than maybe we are used to giving to people. Um, another thing that happens in the ancient world is that things that are privileged, clean and healthy bodies, plenty of food, wine, medicine, beautiful garments, etc. All of those things are desired. Again, not that much different from us today. Contradictions, exaggerations, hyperbolic language, intoxication, all of these things connected to love. I don't think these are unusual. The um, dividing, the, the idea that power divides, the pain of separation, um, the pleasure of a viewed paradise, the possibilities that might happen. We also see animal impulses versus what society says, and we're certainly going to see a lot of animal imagery within them. And we also have nature, also animal imagery, among other things, versus artificiality, which is, you know, makeup, fancy dress, the way something smells, etc. So we see a lot of this within the poetry. So take a look at them. There's a few that I have given. I've only asked you to study one, but you might want to take a look at all of them because they are pretty quick to read. And sure, it'll sound a little archaic, but also I think that it's interesting to see how similar, at least on the foundational basis, they have with our understanding of the emotion of love. Okay, thanks.